Well, a very good morning to you all. I am absolutely delighted to be here for this really exciting panel event on World EV Day, which we have entitled Powering Electric Vehicle Uptake in partnership with BP. It's fantastic to be here on a day that celebrates electric vehicles all around the world. And this day in particular is about getting consumers involved with and excited about electrical vehicles and how they can incorporate them into their everyday lives. And that's very much what this panel is all about. It's about finding ways to give consumers the confidence to make that switch and how different actors, different stakeholders from manufacturers to charging companies, to the government, to consumers can help give ordinary folk the information, uh, the confidence, the education that they need to make that big switch. Now, my normal professional life is on the radio. I present the BBC Five Live Breakfast Show Monday to Friday and do a bit of work at the weekends on BBC Breakfast Television as well. But I am passionate about electric vehicles since I became the owner of one around about four years ago. And in particular, with our audience, which is an audience that is broadly quite skeptical of EVs, I like to get the message out there that these are really accessible cars that so many people can use in their everyday lives. I bought a secondhand old leaf uh, with about 40 odd thousand miles on the clock. That's probably in many ways the newest or uh, most lightly used car I've ever bought with a range of about 80 miles. And that normally gives some people the heebie-jeebies when they hear that, how can you operate on a car with 80 miles? And all the new cars, of course, are way better than that. But for me, it was perfect because this is the car I use every day. I use it to and from work. I use it to pick the kids up from school. I use it to get the shop, go to the shops, go to clubs. And I think it's really important that we get the message out that there are different ways to use EVs and that there is probably an EV out there right now that's suitable for almost all budgets and many, many different lifestyles as well. So I'm really, really enthusiastic about getting involved in this conversation today. But I know that there's still a long way to go before EVs are the dominant vehicles on the road. And I see and hear that cynicism from our audience and other people we speak to every single day. So it's hope that events like this on World EV Day will shift the dial towards a more sustainable transport future. And that is so important for the sake of our children and our grandchildren. So do make sure you get involved on social media to help celebrate World EV Day. Lots of exciting things going on. I've heard that there's a competition for children to create an EV emoji, which is very exciting because normally I just use a leaf on my tweets and social media. We're going to hear, of course, so much more when the UK will be involved in driving COP26 in Glasgow this autumn. And we are also expecting a statement later from the White House, from their climate advisor, Gina McCarthy. That's at around 2.30 this afternoon. So do, do look out for that on your social media channels. Now, we wouldn't be able to put on these events without our partners and our panel partner for this event is BP. Now, BP's purpose is to reimagine energy to help the world reach net zero, which is the target of so many different nations, uh, of course, as you know now. Thank you very much, BP, for supporting World EV Day. And as well, a huge thank you to ABB, our proud headline partner, again, in our second year. So let me introduce the full panel that we have lying ahead for you today. Richard Bartlett is Senior Vice President of Future Mobility and Solutions at Panel Partner BP. Rachel McLean is MP and Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Transport, Decarbonisation and the Future of Transport. We have Sarah Cox, who's Head of Marketing at Volkswagen Passenger Cars, and Oliver Johnson, Head of E-Mobility UK at ABB. Now we'll have the opportunity for a live Q&A with all these fantastic speakers. So please do share your questions for them in the Q&A tab throughout the event. And just to explain, what we're gonna do is invite each of the speakers to come on and talk for a few minutes themselves. Then we'll put your questions to each of them individually. Then we'll bring them all together for a group discussion towards the end. So I hope that's clear. As I say, once again, you can submit your own questions via the Q&A tab. Now to introduce our first speaker from our panel partner, Richard Bartlett, Senior Vice President at Future Mobility and Solutions at BP. 
Now, during Richard's 20 plus years with BP, he has held a number of operational, business development, commercial leadership and finance roles. In his current role, he leads BP's next generation mobility businesses, including electrification and BP Pulse, also mobility services and hydrogen into transport. Richard's team is also accountable for growing BP's strategic mobility partnerships. As I say, do remember to send in your questions for Richard using the Q&A tab, and we'll put some of those to him very shortly. But uh, before we get to that, Richard, a very warm welcome today. And I'm going to hand over to you to give us your insights on where we are at the moment with moving to electric vehicles. Hello. Uh, fantastic to be here. Uh, thank you for your opening remarks. It's an exciting vision, I think, that we're seeing here in front of us. And I'm, I've been recently most impressed by the recently published transport decarbonisation strategy that certainly gives us the pathway we need to move forward. So from aviation to shipping and, of course, electric vehicles, BP is leading the way. And can I start by asking a simple question today? Where are we today? I think the market is booming. In the UK, sales of EVs in 21 will be double 2020 and four times 2019. No OEM, as Sarah will likely testify, is having a problem selling EVs right now. BP operates more than 8,000 public charges across the UK, including the largest number of high-speed charges in the market. It's looking like BP Pulse alone will power around 100 million miles of zero tail pipe emissions in 21 alone. And just today, I'm proud to, to announce we've just opened a, a new ultra fast EV motorway hub in Scotland, and that's 1 million more EV miles each year. So we're partnering with businesses from our EV hub on Park Lane for Uber and other commercial fleets to partnerships with Didi in China, BMW Group and Daimler in Germany and elsewhere, and with VW. Sarah, delighted to be working with you and your company. But this is still a nascent market. We must not take consumer confidence for granted. If we do, we'll fail. So we have to step up. Uh, we'll need to deliver better customer service, which full disclosure is not proving as easy as demand is exploding. Industry reliability will have to go up too, from an average today of 90% to 99.9%. And we, amongst others, are investing millions in both service and reliability, so improvements are certainly coming. We we'll also have to be honest, EVs aren't right for everyone today. The upfront cost can be higher, and it isn't as easy as filling up with petrol, something I know the Minister has rightly said she wants to see. But we can also be proud that it works for so many right now. In less time than it takes for a cup of tea, a Kit Kat and a trip to the loo, you could get more than 100 miles of range for some EVs on our highest speed chargers. We have contactless payment and the ability to pay, to pay for charging without an app or an account. And of course, the total cost of ownership once fuel savings are factored in of an EV is already lower than the traditional vehicle for some drivers. But we'll need to deliver different charging speeds for different needs. It's not one size fits all. I'll repeat that because it's such a critical point we find. We'll need to deliver different charging speeds for different needs. It's not one size fits all. Drivers will need an ultra fast charger if they're on the motorway, but not if you're at the cinema or your car would be full before the adverts had finished. You'll need a 50 kilowatt charger or something slower in that case. And millions of new workplace and home charges will be needed, which we're already delivering. And those without drive aids will need reliable, affordable alternatives, of course. Ultimately, as an industry, we must be bold and innovative. It's our role to design, engineer, and above all, deliver. We must win the confidence of the consumer and, of course, government to deliver the vital infrastructure. But we will get there. Let's think for a moment about how we might measure success. It won't just be counting the number of charges, that's for sure. It's not about the size of your network, but what it can deliver. Rushing to put in charging, regardless of the speed, into street furniture isn't the answer. If one of our ultra-fast chargers was charging for just one third of the time, it would deliver about 1,000 kilowatt hours a day. A simple, a single lamppost charger would deliver just 40 kilowatt hours in the same amount of time. 
So local, regional, devolved and national government can think creatively about this. And in particular about land use too. There is land out there that could be reassigned and reprioritized for EV charging hubs. We won't meet the forecast demand otherwise. So we're going to be working closely with government on this, not just with Rachel and her colleagues in the DFT, but with Bayes 2, OZEB of course, Downing Street, Treasury and Ofgem. I want to end on the one piece of work we have to prioritize to drive progress and deliver consumer confidence. Firstly, many new charges on public, private, commercial land or even at home require new or upgraded connections to the electricity grid. This can involve complex negotiations with the DNOs and other parties. And as an industry, this element of the journey is going much, much too slowly to the detriment, sadly, of the driver, or should I say the voter, minister and industry. We must all do better here. Some EV charging points can take the best part of a year to install, and simply this just isn't good enough. BP is absolutely committed to working closely with the DNOs to drive the change, just as BP is transforming its ways of working, DNOs I'm sure will transform theirs as well. In some areas we may need government guidance on more helpful interpretations of existing obligations, and yes, legislation probably will be required too. On Saturday, I'm sure you all read that Ofgem announced a new approach to how grid connections for new charging hubs will be funded. This will need careful implementation, but it is certainly a welcome start. So this is about partnerships ultimately, and together we can get this right among some great panelists I'm joined with today, accelerating progress in British EV charging infrastructure, delivering a wave of innovation by British companies to export around the world, and above all, reducing the UK's emissions and carbon footprint helping it meet its net zero targets. This is why I feel I have the best job in the world right now as we accelerate towards what I think is a brilliant and incredibly exciting EV future. Thank you so much for listening. Richard, thank you very much. Um, I mean, the questions are flying in for you. And I think as ever, whenever we talk about electric vehicles, charging infrastructure is absolutely central to all the discussions, isn't it? I love the idea that you measure charging efficiency by a cup of tea, a Kit Kat and, and nipping to the loo. Um, <laughs> and contactless payment, accessibility is so important. The number of times I've had to download apps or fathom my way through complex um, mechanics just to try and work out how to charge my vehicle is bonkers so I think that's absolutely key let me go to some of the questions then uh, this one here as an EV user we need EV charge points to be as available and reliable as all the Tesla supercharger networks what are you going to do to ensure all pumps are available uh, with uh, that and when will it be achieved yeah so it's a great question and probably one of the, the biggest pain points I think the, if I look at BP Pulse, we've got three speeds of the network. We focus very much on the ultra fast charging network, the, the, the rapid 50 kilowatt network, and then you've got the slower street posts of seven kilowatts. And I think the, the key thing that we're committed to doing is investing significant amounts of money and upgrading all of that infrastructure, both the hardware, but also the software that interacts with the customer. So we recognize there's a lot more to do. Uh, I think this is a, a problem shared by many of the other players in the industry, but as I think over time, you'll start to see the increased modernization of the infrastructure. You'll see more of it with much customer friendlier interfaces that will provide customers with, with the solutions. What, what kind of time scale are you talking about? I mean, oh, I know already, it's obviously an ongoing process, but... Yeah, Rachel, we're already very much in action. So we're already investing millions of dollars this year in upgrading both the back-end technology that interacts with customers plus the hardware that you see when you charge your car. Yeah. Um, another question here. Uh, Charge Master Polar and BP Pulse have been key to increasing EV adoption. However, recently reliability and support has dropped off significantly. So that's one point. And then I'll ask another question here because I think it feeds into it as well. Gradual expansion of BP Pulse's customer support. Why is that not more effective given bp's vast financial reserves it needs to be expanded faster yeah fully fully agree so we're recruiting heavily uh in our customer service center based in milton Keynes to deal with a 300 percent increase year on year in phone call demand into the call center so the, the demand for the guidance around 
uh, installations in the home or how to, to, to activate their subscription to the, to the platform. Um, plus also uh, we're investing, as I said, heavily in new infrastructure that will bring the high reliability that you'd expect from a company like BP and it should parallel that of a fueling experience. So when you go to a BP today, as well as you visit the Marks Spencers, you, you expect that seamless experience. That's what we are building, that capability to execute here in the UK right now. There's no doubt that BP is having to rapidly repurpose its function and indeed repurpose its image in a world of climate change and impending climate disaster. So we have a question here about that. Most consu consumers still equate BP with oil, it's in the name British Petroleum. What is BP doing to shift this perspective? Do you envisage an electric only future? No, so it's a, it's, a, it's a great question. So I think different economies around the world are moving at different paces first. Okay, so I think that we are very much a company that's committed to a net zero future by 2050 uh, or sooner. And as the strap line of the company says, we're, we're reinventing ourselves. So we're investing heavily in new low carbon businesses that will ultimately deliver the net zero future so if you look at the businesses my team leads uh, through bp pulse uh, our scale-up plans are very significant and if you look at markets like germany and the uk um you know the, the car park increase uh of evs is huge it's much higher than expected um so will transport in the northern european economies or european economies move to electric i think it's, it's absolutely clear and with government support around 50 to 55 and so on. Uh, the transition is very evident. As I said in my opening remarks, I think uh, the OEMs aren't struggling to sell electric vehicles at the moment. It's, it's perhaps uh, the ability to supply more. Yeah. And um, you, you said yourself it's cheaper to power an electric car than it is to fill it up with petrol diesel. Um, so inevitably, if lots of people start transitioning to EVs, you will lose money plus the massive investment you're putting into this system. Do you think it's therefore also inevitable that we're going to see the cost of electricity rising for EV users? No, so I, I don't think it's a question of, well, I think we'll be, our, fuel, our income from fuels will decline over time. The income from electrification will grow over time. And if you, if you, if you see that a lot of the real estate we have in the mobility business, we also have a very large convenience franchise with so the, the combination of convenience, the Marks and Spencer's types offerings in, in the UK, combined with new electrification that meets the new car park and the customer needs, I see this as an opportunity rather than a threat. You know, so we're going to transition to the new business models. We're already taking action. We're investing heavily. And I think the name of the game really is around how do we delight the customers with the experiences that they, they seek. Massive to talk about. I mean, we could do an all, a whole hour with you, Richard, but we will bring you back a little bit later on into the group discussion. Thank you so much for the time being. We really My pleasure. Thank it. you, Rachel. So that's Richard Bartlett from BP there. And as I say, he'll be back a little bit later on. But right now, it is time to welcome our next guest. And I'm delighted to welcome Rachel McLean. Now, yes. Rachel is Conservative MP for Redditch and has served since the 8th of June 2017. She also holds the government post of Parliamentary Undersecretary of State for Transport Decarbonisation and the Future of Transport. So it is a huge role, particularly in the context of climate change and of course COP26, as I mentioned earlier, coming up. Uh, Minister, I'm very pleased that we could uh, uh, welcome you today, that you have time to join us. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my great pleasure. Can I just quickly check that the sound and video is okay at your end? Great. Thank you, Rachel. Um, and good morning. And it's a real pleasure to be here. As you said yourself, I'm also an EV driver. And so I never like to miss an opportunity to champion this technology, particularly on a day like today. So thanks again for the invite. So um, as Rich has already mentioned, we published our really, I think I'm not going to hesitate to say, a world leading transport decarbonisation plan, um, which is incredibly ambitious, but also achievable. Because with transport, it is our biggest source of carbon emission. So it is vital that we find ways to travel more cleanly. And the plan sets out that route to a sustainable future. And it isn't just about reducing global temperatures, vital though that is, it's also about creating communities free from pollution and congestion, 
on placing the UK at the forefront of green technology, creating new skill jobs, levelling up our whole country and recovering from the pandemic. EVs aren't the silver bullet, but they do pack a huge punch. Because if we removed 100% of emissions from our roads, we'd re remove 90% of the source of transport emissions, which actually is an incredible statistic and an incredible opportunity as well. And that's why we as a government have pledged to phase out the sale of new polluting cars and vans by 2035. And we're putting our money where our mouth is. We are committing £2.8 billion altogether in a package to support industry and consumers make that transition to zero emission vehicles. That includes a plug-in car grant of up to £2,500, which has so far helped fund the purchase of 200,000 zero emission vehicles. And industry are coming forward with new models all the time. We can see over 100 models on the market now. Um, and what we're seeing is that the variety of different price points is ex increasing exponentially. The number of EVs priced under £35,000 has increased by 50%. And let me be clear, I want to see those vehicles being built right here in the UK. We're already the second largest market for ultra low emission vehicles. And we have, of course, a world leading uh, and renowned manufacturing sector. I'm a West Midlands MP. I'm, I feel this in my bones. It's something that I've always, always championed. Um, and that's why it's right that we have put a billion pounds into uh, the Automotive Transformation Fund to build a world leading electric supply chain right here in the UK. Cost and supply are vital, but of course, the most important way is to build driver confidence by improving the driver experience. And uh, Richard's already referred, and the questioners have already referred rightly to those as have you, uh, Rachel. So we have to confront those barriers that are holding EVs back. Uh, the first one is range anxiety, it's what we always hear. And that's why we're investing £1.3 billion to build that infrastructure, that world-class charging infrastructure that drivers deserve. And voters, as you said, um, we have already installed 25,000 public charge points and more rapid chargers per, per 100 mile of our road network than any other country in Europe. And in two years time, every motorway service station in the country will have six rapid powered chargers. Um, so we, we will see more home, more workplace, more on-street charging, obviously all meeting different use cases. I fully agree with Richard on that point. Um, we are making money available to local councils, 20 million pounds, for them to install those charging uh, points where people don't have their own drives. So install their, installing them on lamp posts or in other suitable local areas. And we're still providing those grants for individuals up to 350 pounds so that you can install that domestic charger in your own home, charging up while you sleep. And so one of the themes of today's discussion is the role of policymakers. And I would be the first to agree that we in government don't have the answers, which is why uh, we, we continually consult with experts and with industry. Uh, and that's what we've done when we're looking at the EV driving experience. And I know this is, again, probably the other biggest pain point. Uh, so all those questions around how do we locate charge points? How do we pay quickly and simply? So we're not downloading multiple apps and having to sign up to different accounts. Uh, how can we reassure drivers a network is reliable when you get to your charge point? It's going to work. It won't be broken. Um, we know that these are issues we're going to tackle. Uh, I'm sure I'm going to get questioned on it, but we are publishing our um, response to that consultation very soon. And we will be committing to lay legislation to fix some of these problems, most of these problems, um, before the end of the year. We are going to be saying a lot more about the infrastructure strategy uh, across the whole piece that needs to underpin our transition to electric vehicles. We will be publishing the first EV infrastructure strategy this year, and that will set out exactly how we're going to build a world class infrastructure system. We're ready for those nine million electric cars and vans that we hope to be on Britain's roads by 2030. Um, we know that everybody, all the actors, have got a role to play, including businesses, including energy providers and government. We all have to come together, as we are already doing, to map out where the infrastructure is still lacking and to enable us to fill those gaps. So let me leave you with this as my final thought. We will continue 
to set the right conditions and provide that generous financial support. But we will need the help of businesses to continue to make Britain EV ready. This is the defining decade in our battle for climate change, so there's no time to lose. So I look forward to our discussion later, later on in the session. Well, before you go anywhere, and thank you very much, Rachel McLean, we have some questions that have come through uh, from participants watching and listening to everything today. So let's try and fly through a few of those if we can. I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know how much of a live issue this is for your constituents in the West Midlands. Um, but a question here more specifically, what do you see as being the single greatest challenge in the transition to electric vehicles? Is it consumer sentiment? Is it grid capacity? battery range, charger installation, or something else? In a way, you've covered all those points. Uh, yes, it is a live issue for my constituents. That, that's the first point. And to sort of pick out on your second question, I can confidently say that grid capacity is not a challenge. And you, and you will hear that if you speak to the national grid, they are very well prepared through a number of measures and working across the whole piece and the whole power system. We know that we'll have the grid capacity there through a combination of the work that that government's doing with renewable incentives and a number of other things. So we, we are not concerned about that at all. It's important that we keep on saying that because often people do think um, that you know the grid's going to blow up if everybody plugs in. But I think as Rich has already said, people are not all gonna plug in at the same time. And of course the whole system is going to be made smart and intelligent. And in fact, we're going to see prices of ele electricity come down as we make this transition. But I think I've already alluded to the, the, the main ones. They are the range anxiety, which actually, we find that's often more of a perceived barrier than a real one. And I know that you'll probably find this yourself, Rachel, when you've actually made that transition, you probably find that, yes, you do have to make one or two long journeys, maybe once a month or so on to do whatever you're doing. But most of the journeys will be short journeys, they're routine, you'll charge at home, you'll not, you know, set out fully charged and you know what you're doing. Um, so, and that we, we can see that in the stats because we know that when EV drivers switch, I think something like 98% of drivers who switch to an electric vehicle say they won't go back. So I think that's definitive proof. I think there are real issues still around that in interoperability of the charging network. We do have lots of different providers. It is a real pain, um, but we are definitely, since I've been the minister, which I'm pleased I've been the minister now for nearly two years, and I've been able to really drive this work through. It, it sounds quite boring and techy, uh, sort of consumer experience consultation but it is really important because it's about when you actually go to the charge point is it going to work what happens if it's broken can you actually get hold of someone to fix it will you be able to pay with a contactless uh, just as easily as you pay for your petrol and we do need to fix those real practical issues and we are doing the way you and Richard describe it, um, it makes it sound like a brave new world where everything's going to be cheaper and run efficiently. But the cynical journalist in me says someone's going to make money from this somewhere along the way and the consumers will end up paying for it. But look, let's see what happens. It's fair to say other countries do much better than the UK in terms of pushing forward electric cars. And Norway is one question here, uh, which uh, has done much better, according to the person who sent this in, on encouraging EV car purchase through incentives and penalties for ICE uh, vehicles. What can you learn from Norway's approach to become the top European for EV take up? Well, I, I strongly disagree with the premise of your question, to be fair. Uh, no, not my question. That was sent in to uh, us. Just fair, to fair enough. Uh, I, either yourself or the questioner, I strongly disagree with that. The facts do not bear that out. We are a world leader um, in this transition. We are the only country to have set out such an ambitious phase out date for petrol and di diesel cars. Don't forget, Norway does not have an automotive manufacturing industry, a homegrown industry. That makes a massive difference. We have to consider all those millions of people who are working in that industry. Um, and, and also we have to work with industry because we are relying on them to come up with the new models, the cheaper and better models that all of our, all of our residents and people living in this country can buy. So of course, I always look at what other countries are doing. I, I actually reject very strongly that proposition. Um, I'm very proud that we actually have one of the best charging networks in Europe. We have an extremely generous mm. package of incentives to, to enable people to buy cars. And that is why we've seen, um, I think so far this year, one in seven cars that have been bought have a plug. So we are absolutely doing a lot of things right. We can do more. I would agree with that. But I, I am going to be very, very robust in that answer. 
No problem. Well, look, thank you very much. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we're, we're grateful that you're able to stick around, hear our other speakers and join us at least in part for some of the group discussion in a few minutes time. So thank you very much, uh, Rachel McLean, Minister um, and uh, Parliamentary, let me get the title exactly right, uh, Parliamentary Undersecretary of State Transport Decarbonisation and Future of Transport. Right. Uh, time now to move on to our next panellist and um, we can welcome Sarah Cox who is Head of Marketing at Volkswagen Passenger Cars. Uh, she's a proud brand guardian with a passion for people and for making a difference all while having fun along the way. Having spent her entire working life in the automotive industry she values integrity, curiosity and creativity, qualities which she has held across a very career in sales operations, after sales, training academy, marketing and corporate social responsibility. And again, uh, do remember to submit your questions for Sarah, who I'm delighted to say is joining us now. Thank you, Sarah, and over to you. Uh, it's great to be here, like everybody else said. I think, um, yeah, I'm also a proud EV driver, as you would expect, uh, working for Volkswagen. Um, but I definitely feel really passionate, and it was one of the big motivations for me to take this role when I joined Volkswagen um, last year. I think there's plenty that the car manufacturers have to do in helping the consumers make the switch to electric vehicles. And that's not only about bringing the products to the market that are affordable, but it's also very much about making the owning and the driving of them as easy as possible as well. And starting to tackle some of the blockers that are preventing uh, many consumers you know, considering the switch or making the switch as well. If we talk about the product, you know, a couple of the, the guys have already alluded to it, you know, it's, it's moving at great speed already and there's so many new models coming to market. And if I talk about Volkswagen for a moment, you know, we launched the ID3, the ID4 and the ID4 GTX since last September. And only this week we uh, previewed two more models at the Munich Motor Show, including the ID Life concept. And, and why that's important is that one will be a smaller car segment, you know, a, a lower price point around 20,000 euros. And that will help us with that affordability piece, which is really important, again, to help more consumers make that switch into electric vehicles. And of course, there'll be loads more models to come from us as well. I mean, ultimately, we are, are building an electric vehicle lineup that is every bit as comprehensive as the traditional you know, ICE range that we have at the moment. And it's not just obviously about Volkswagen. The fact that our competitors are also launching so many new EVs, that really actually helps us to re reach those reluctant consumers. You know, I guess, put simply, the more cars that are available on the market and the more visible they are, whether that's in communications and on the roads, the more likely it is that potential customers are going to be reassured that you know electric vehicles are the norm and they are the mainstream and here to stay. I think one of the other things that's really important to help us um, with the consumer um, switchover is third-party advocacy. That plays a really important role. You know, one way of doing that is through awards and great reviews because they provide reassurance and, and they're really important in the consumer buying purchase process. Again, if I use the ID3, for example, we've won 12 major accolades in the UK alone for that one model in the last year. Um, to name a couple, Game Changer of the Year from Top Gear, GQ called it the best family car and Auto Express best small company car. But what you'll notice about those and why it's important is none of those awards have the word electric in the title. You know, the ID3 is going up against its traditional ICE competitors. And I think that's the sort of recognition that really helps, again, convince the sort of more sceptical people that actually you know, these cars are as good, if not better. Um, there's, of course, still more fears around, you know, what people don't know. It's the uncertainty potentially around what you don't know that creates these barriers and sometimes these crazy urban myths, you know, which just simply aren't true. You know, things like, you know, the battery will drain rapidly if you're stuck in a major traffic jam. You know, I think collectively, uh, we have a responsibility within the automotive sector to dispel these myths and provide accurate information at every touch point a, a consumer has. And one very powerful method of convincing those people that are less sure is, is certainly showing real life experience of the vehicles from genuine owners. And that's something that we've um, we use that approach through our social media and some content on our websites. Um, and actually, I, I really enjoy you know, this sort of content as a, a marketeer, you know, showing real customers. We've done some films with ID3 owners, for example, and, and none of these guys were given a script. It was purely about them talking to the camera and it gives you real authentic you know, content um, where these customers are genuinely talking about how their EV ownership has changed their lives and, and why they won't go back. 
We've also seen our own employees do that as well. So more and more people are sharing their own EV ownership experiences on things like LinkedIn, which is great from an influential audience point of view, but also helps you sort of get into topics like range anxiety and charging, charging worries. And then, of course, we work really closely with the media. So our, our PR teams are ensuring that key journalists have, you know, all the information they need to create great content. But in-depth reviews and comparison tests are really important. We know, again, you know, that's a, a really um, important part of the consumer journey for their, their buying considerations, along with the digital tools that you might find on the websites as well. And then, obviously, we've talked about charging quite a lot, you know, um, and, and as Richard said, you know, we're really proud to be having a partnership with BT, BP as well. We also have a partnership with Tesco since 2018, where 407 kilowatt quad point charging bays have been installed at the Tesco stores across the UK. And, and they are free for any car brand owner to use. Um, and I think what's important, you know, with, with both of those partnerships is this is Volkswagen's um, this is us supporting the whole EV ownership experience and breaking down another one of those barriers to purchase around that charging accessibility. And, and in particular, if people don't have charging at home, these, these are great solutions for them. And, you know, we're not alone, of course, you know, again, we've touched on it in the UK and at a European level, there are many other manufacturers also investing in partnerships with charging organisations to help speed up that infrastructure implementation and increase the accessibility for, for everybody. I think seeing and driving the cars is obviously a great way to give consumers that confidence to make the switch to electric vehicles. Um, and that's why uh, we like to be present at some of the key experiential events as well. So we were at the Fully Charged Live event last weekend and Goodwood First Law Speed had an electric avenue in the summer and we were there. And we're also running our own ride and drive event with fleet customers, for example, as well. So it's, it's great to get people behind the wheels and just try the product for, your, for yourself. And then another different angle as well is getting cars to subscription providers, so such as Onto. It's a great way of reaching those consumers that are not necessarily ready to fully purchase to make that commitment. Um, but you know, with no strings attached, you know, customers can get into an electric vehicle for an extended period of time uh, and really get to live with it and understand how EV can fit into their life. And, and I genuinely think you know, those sorts of models will really help um, more people convert to a, a longer term ownership of electric vehicles. From a marketing point of view, you, you can already see a bias to uh, advertising around um, plug-in hybrids and electric vehicles. And it's not just about the TV adverts. Uh, another Volkswagen example would be our global sponsorship of the UEFA Euro 2020 tournament in the summer. And that paid real dividends for us in terms of driving awareness, driving awareness of our way to zero strategy and also the ID3 and the ID4 product range. You know, we saw website inquiries shoot up you know, through each match and when the games are live, but also it has sustained at a higher level due to that increased awareness around that product being available as well. And it certainly helps by the tiny football car bringing the uh, ball onto the, the pitch, the, uh, the mini ID4. Um, and so, yeah, so once the consumer then reaches the retailer's doors, we know that um, they may have already made up their mind and be ready to purchase. But we also know that they could be quickly put off if a salesperson is ill-informed. And it's really important, therefore, that you know, all manufacturers are providing highly uh, comprehensive training for our network staff on the product, but also that end-to-end -end ownership as well, you know, including things like home charging. So yeah, plenty that I think we can be doing and should be doing, uh, and it's much more than just delivering great products. It's, it's absolutely that collective responsibility around helping the transition and making it easy and enjoyable for consumers along the way. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I loved that little car, by the way, during the Euros. I thought it was brilliant. <laughs> Um, and it's really interesting what you say about marketing, because I can't remember the last time I saw an advert on the telly in the cinema, to be honest, a billboard advert for an ICE vehicle. Every advert these days from any manufacturer seems to be either full electric or hybrid. And that's a question that's come through to us. Advertising is a major driver of consumer demand. Does VW have a plan to phase out ICE advertising? Do you do any ICE advertising still? We, we do do a bit, you know, to be honest. Um, and of course, we have such a wide portfolio of products um, still within market. But I think the reality is then that will shift and become more and more dominant by our electric product offering. And because that is the future in terms of the new product launches that we have. So this year, about 50 percent is probably electric vehicles. And that will grow and grow as, as the portfolio grows as well. Great question here. A VW has some of the most iconic vehicles in the world, including the Beetle and the Microbus. Now, you made an electric prototype 
of the Type 2 microbus in 2019. Uh, but as far as we know, there are no production plans. So a lot of people are asking, are you going to start mass producing electric versions of the classics? So I think uh, what, what they're referring to is uh, the ID Buzz, um, which uh, caused a great storm when that came out. And yes, um, the ID Buzz will go into production, a passenger car version, and uh, like the, the camper van and, and the, uh, the cargo version as well. And that will come late next year. Oh, that will excite a lot of people, I know, won't it? Uh, so they won't have to do their own homegrown, homemade electrifications, which I know a lot <laughs> of people do as well. Um, this one here, as an EV driver, it seems to me the main sticking point is down to infrastructure. Now, I know that that's something we've addressed with our other panellists, but it is such an important part of this discussion. It's worth reading this question. Uh, the cars are already amazing, says this uh, person. Does VW have any plans to get more directly involved in the design and manufacturing of chargers along the lines of what Tesla has done? Yeah, so we we, um, we do have our, our own charging points for um, for homes or at the the, uh, the, the LE chargers uh, that will come back into the market in the UK next year. We have it in the European market. Um, so and obviously we have partnerships like uh, BP for more public charging. Right. And this one here, does VW have any plans to expand into other types of e-mobility? Because we don't just talk about private car hire these days. So e-bikes, e-scooters and so on. Yeah. So uh, as a group, we definitely are getting involved in that. You can see the future of uh, the e-scooters uh, definitely will help with the congested city problems, for example. So um, so in in Sayat, for example, uh, they have already started launching their electric scooter. I think it's the, the Sayat EXS. And the Volkswagen brand is looking to get active in that field as well. So uh, we talked about the city skater and that will come with various markets over the next few years as well. So no definite dates around the UK. But yes, as a group, at a global level, we do see an opportunity there to help with uh, particularly like congestion in the cities. And, and somebody sent a question. Um, I'll just address this very quickly because I think it's really important, interesting, because I've had experience with this myself, about the knowledge of dealers and in dealerships and how much they know about electric vehicles. Now, having bought, I've been through two EVs actually, secondhand, I would go to a secondhand car dealership and I would tell them all about the car and what I knew I had to look out for and what it did and how it behaved. Now, I don't have experience of buying one new, but I know that there is, when I've just ask questions if I've been in a garage forecourt. I know there's a big gap in knowledge amongst a lot of the staff at these dealerships. Is that something you're addressing? Yes, absolutely. And um, so when we launched new products, like when we brought ID3 into the market last year, we had really in-depth digital experience training for all of the network staff. So not just the sales teams, it should be everybody within within the network, the same with technical training as well. But that's oh, that's an always on. It's not just when we bring the model into the market. We obviously update that each time there's a new model. But yes, there's an always on uh, program of electric training, uh, but it is vital. And you know that, that whole experience in the showroom, you know, has to be amazing. Uh, and consumers can get to so much research themselves online. Uh, and, and we have a job to do to make sure that that knowledge level is the same within our, in our retailers. Brilliant, exciting, exciting to hear about what you might do in the future. Thank you very much, Sarah. And Sarah will be back for our group discussion in a few minutes time. Uh, but I should say that we have now got time for our final panelist today. And our final speaker is Oliver Johnson, Head of eMobility UK at ABB. Now, Oliver has been heavily involved in both the technical and commercial deployment of medium and high power charging right throughout the UK. And again, if you have any questions directly for Oliver, as you'll have heard me putting them to our panellists this morning, please send them through to us and we will be able then to put them to our guests once we've heard from them. So, Oliver, let me hand over to you for a few moments. Thank you um, and good afternoon, everybody. I think we passed that hour in the day will be passed into the afternoon. Um, thank you for all of the uh, conversations that have taken so far, I'm not quite sure left what I've got to say um, because a lot of things have been discussed. So I will touch a little bit on uh, ABB um, and I will um, also um, talk through various um, parts of the journey that ABB has taken to get us into this um, space in the EV market being a leading vendor of technology to charge the cars. So. I think when you look at ABB, we joined the journey in EV probably 12 years ago now when we 
purchased a small startup called Epion in the Netherlands and have heavily invested in that over the last 12 years and worked with the organizations in the world and the car OEMs. So you've got Charon and Chadimo that have uh, really been at the forefront of driving this technology because uh, part of the ability to charge a car in a good way is, is really founded on standardization. So this is rather boring for most people and using a car, you just want to turn up, plug it in and it works every single time in a seamless way. But there's lots of technology that sits behind that plug both on the vehicle and in the charger, which makes all of that work. So ABB has really been at the forefront of the standardization bodies that sit behind that and work with the OEMs behind closed fences and closed doors. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with most of the UK OEMs, which are producing electric vehicles in the UK or designing electric vehicles in the UK, but right across the market globally, we work with all of the OEMs. And this puts us in a good position because we understand uh, how the vehicles work, how the communications work between the car and the chargers. And we try and uh, improve that slowly over time and work with the OEM cars and the standardization body to try and get that seamless interoperability between the vehicles and the chargers that people really want. Now, because of the different car manufacturers that are out there, because of the different technologies that exist, um, that's been dreamt up in different parts of the world in terms of design teams, this is, uh, is always a challenge. So this is something that we're always improving or always pushing small updates to our equipment over the, in the world to make sure that every time new vehicles come to the market, we test them, we check them with our equipment and make sure that by the time it ends up on the street for Joe Public to plug into that we've got good technology. Um, so that's just a bit of a technology roadmap, but today ABB has grown some to a substantial vendor of this type of equipment. So we've got about 800 employees, about 250 R&D engineers. Um, and earlier on, uh, Richard talked to, from BP talked about the number of charge sessions, the number of miles delivered. They were talking about a million miles delivered. We, we calculate roughly we've delivered about 1.5 trillion miles of electrification into cars, buses, um, heavy goods vehicles, all types of vehicles that our equipment have plugged into. Um, our manufacturing is global. We've got chargers in uh, roughly 85 different countries, about 20,000 different pieces of equipment out of there. Um, and the pressure to build new manufacturing facilities and the pressures on the whole supply chain in the whole world, both to produce vehicles and chargers, is immense right now. Now, even if you're a builder building a house right now, everyone's acutely aware of the supply issues that are in the market of materials as simple as building materials. And this is a global challenge for both OEMs and also uh, equipment manufacturers like ABB. Um, when you're looking at high power charging in the UK and even regular charging, say 50 kilo or home charging, we've got lots of equipment deployed with many of the uh, leading car OEMs and the leading charge point operators. ABB doesn't operate the equipment. We generally sell the tech to operators like BP, like other customers we've got in the UK. And the idea is to bring that to the customers in the best way possible, where they've got help desks, they've got support functions um, to, to really give the consumer the experience that they're looking after. Uh, and then we're really there to look after the deep tech, as it were. Um, I guess the going back to the questions is how do you accelerate and make it easier for anyone to switch? I think the key bit there is um, somebody once told me you have to do something a hundred times to form a habit. And I'm always astounded every time I go to a charge point to charge my car that um, the number of people that have no clue what they're doing or the number of people that I bump into is the first time they've charged because they typically charge the car at home and it's typically the first time they've plugged into a, uh, a public charger. And many of the cars work in different ways. You have to lock them, unlock them, different catches, et cetera. So the, 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 the habitualization of charging a car needs to become quite um, embedded in people and understood by people. And I think the, um, in the same way that fueling, you know, putting fuel in a normal car um, it, it is, it is really a uh, it should just become standard and then part of the technology that's evolving in the background um, that we're working on and have been involved in is this plug and charge so the the networks can recognize your vehicle when you plug in so once you've uh, 
associated it with your account you can then just plug in and it automatically recognizes it as a, a bona fide user um, as an account and then takes the the money out of your account as it were um, but that avoids the human interaction with it but i think contactless i think that's being covered by everybody is a, is a key thing to allow anybody to charge especially the newbies or the people that won't publicly charge very often um, Again, many people may own an EV and may only do one or two long journeys in their in their average month or average year. And at that stage, they just want to do tap and go and, and progress the way that on their journey in a good way. Um, so I think all of those things need to be simple from a home charging point of view. I think those things also need to become habitual. And I think they also need to be made, made much easier from implementation from a domestic installation point of view. My personal experience having to deal with UK power networks, dealing with my electricity retailer, dealing with my uh, installer, as it were, to get those things on the wall. I think that process also needs some uh, legislative change to make it easier for the installers to remove fuses or do works on behalf of your local DNO. Um, and all of those things will change those things as well. Um, just another thought while we've sort of thinking about things, an interesting one, um, ADB has been doing an emoji competition for some to really motivate the future users of EV cars and inspire them. Um, and we get a lot of inspiration uh, through that, and that should be announced today who the winner of that is. But that made me think about my own son who's currently learning to drive, and he's hassling me to, to get hold of a car, which is an automatic, so he can gain an automatic driving license, sorry, a manual driving license, um, because the EV is no good to him to learn if he wants to use a manual car in the future. So there's just a little nugget there, maybe, of, uh, of things. Um, just looking forward, um in terms of addressing we've talked about the dnos we've talked about the connection issues related to setting up charging hubs um richard's covered that rachel's covered that these are very very uh raw points at the moment getting land getting connections for electricity this has to become much easier um to help the electricity networks um the future tech the high power the contactless easy cable management in the future, we're also looking into virtual power plants. So where domestic installations running on AC chargers are also connected to the grid network. When if the grid network has an issue with power, we can throttle all of those devices. And this is very much something which we're looking into in the future, which we're delivering today with partners. And this will also help the UK and its electricity network grow and develop and support the EV network. So I think some of the points have been covered by the other uh, speakers very well. So I've dropped them out of my uh, conversation, but hopefully a little bit of insight from myself. Do you know what? I think you've raised a really interesting point, though, about young people learning to drive, because I was wondering whether my 15 year old would indeed need to learn to drive a manual car. <laughs> you know, I, I think I think it's fascinating to know. And then that's a change to the whole driving test, isn't it? Anyway. Um, without getting into that, but it is part of the discussion when we look at the future. Um, some questions for you, Oliver, if that's okay. That's fine. Um, a question here. So these, these, these are questions that have come into me, so not necessarily my view. Uh, here's one. Uh, your charging technology and expertise is behind many, if not most, of today's chargers. What continue to be the biggest challenges? What are the most exciting developments you see coming? Um, sure. So I think some of the most... Uh, some of the challenges are just another huge number of different EVs that are arriving on the market. And again, it comes back down to this habitual charging thing. So people's experience and the nuances that go with that. So that's a big challenge. And I said, you know, the, the amount of times I go to a charge station and, and chat with various different people that really have not got a clue, A, how their car functions and B, how the charger should interact with the car, even if it's just literally plug in, tap your card, they still mess with the screen, do different things. So there's a whole user experience type thing that needs to, or the education become, needs to become habitual or, or understood. Um, and in terms of developments, we're, we're constantly pushing the envelope of high power charging so that the ability to deliver, um, we've already got that in many of the charge point operators in the UK today, the ability to deliver 350 kilowatts. And for the nerds out there, that's up to 500 amps of energy going into your car. 
Um, and so there's cars out there that are already taking that energy and, and you can charge that fast. And I think that will continue to be um, an interesting development, how that's deployed and, and the cables that you need to do that and the cable management you need to do that. Uh, one key thing is the car OEMs, and there may be a, a question back to Sarah, they keep putting the sockets in the cars in different places. Yeah, And the, the, the advantage Tesla has got, they've all got the socket on the rear left-hand side and everybody else has splattered them around the car. So we've spent a lot of time and a lot of energy producing highly flexible, super thin, super uh, liquid cool cables with very long reaches on them to reach around the cars to meet all of these sockets, regardless of what the parking arrangement you have, drive through, end in, rear in, whatever you want, however you want to put your car, you can get to the socket with the cable. So. Yeah, uh, that's a great point. And, and we will ask Sarah that later. I'll let you directly address that point with her. <laughs> and I'm so embarrassed to say I still get because I charge pretty much solely at home when I do yeah. have to do a, a charging point. I'm, I, I still have that panic where I go, what's the right pinhole, which is ridiculous. Four years on, completely ridiculous. Um, another one here, um, the transition to fleets. Uh, is currently an important driver of EV demand and, of course, will bolster the second-hand EV market going down the line. ABB is committed to 100% electric fleet by 2025, and we are rapidly getting towards that date. So the question is, how's it going? Yeah, it's it's um, it's going very well, actually. So um, we were part of a sort of, a, and my colleague um, uh, were part of a sort of an internal team that um, pushed the UK forward as part of a um, one of the first countries in ABB to go all electric. So I think we're halfway through our fleet by now. Um, so I think our fleet of 400 cars, we're, we're up to 200 vehicles in that fleet. Um, now, many of those have, have happened or come to pass during the, uh, the lockdown periods. So, uh, so people are, are now desperately wanting the, the public char charging infrastructure to, to meet the demand that they're driving. And, and we get lots of feedback from that. So yeah, we're halfway there. Um, we will meet the target definitely because the the roll off of the end of the uh, the scale. Um, we are still looking at larger fleet vehicles with longer range for service engineers. So that's also uh, there's more vehicles coming into that space from some of the OEMs that we're working as well. So that should also be we should be able to click those vehicles off the list as well where they need maybe 250, 300 mile range with a full load, which aren't really available today. OK, when are we going to see the emoji, by the way, the winning emoji? I don't know. I've been set, 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 separately chatting in the background with somebody else on uh, on chat to try and find out where it is and what it looks like, so I could potentially Can you give us a world exclusive here. Yeah, that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to stick it on my backdrop, but it's not. It's not there. So, yeah, well, it's not on my phone yet because I've been looking for that as well. <laughs> um, and and just a final question before we go to our, our group discussion, uh, and it's one about I suppose how we compare to Europe, which is something that came up when we spoke to Rachel McLean earlier. Uh, but this question, I've seen reports that ABB rapid chargers tend to be more reliable on the European mainland because they are better established and there are more extensive maintenance teams. Is that true? And if so, what is being done to try and meet those sorts of standards here in the UK? Yeah, sure. So the, the, the European, depending on the networks you're talking about, depends on how they're supported. So it's really um, dependent on what's already deployed. And a lot of the statistics come out of um, what's being done in the past, etc. So the UK is going through a massive growth and there's some catch up taking place in terms of serviceability and the ability to get to things quickly. And, uh, and again, uh, that will increase and will become um, in line with the European expectations that have been set forward. But again, in the UK, you've seen obviously the government mantra of 99 point uh, whatever it is percent, but certainly in the, uh, the high 90s, not in the, the middle 90s as to where we are today. OK, brilliant. I have been told that apparently the winning emoji is available online somewhere so i think we should see if we can get hold of it so okay, we can share well, I'll maybe it. leave that to our uh <laughs> I'll leave it to you guys to dig that out and stick it up I, 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 well I, I'm, I'm doing my best listen thank you so much so that is oliver johnson and at this stage i want to invite all our panelists to come back and join us together once again uh, richard bartlett from bp rachel mclean parliamentary under secretary of state transport decarbonization and future of transport sarah cox from volkswagen and oliver johnson who's just been there head of eu mobility for abb thank you once again all of you uh, for joining us now rachel i know your time with us is limited so once richard is back and up and running i want to hand over to him because i know he's got got a question i think richard 
that you would like to put to Rachel directly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. So thank you. I've really enjoyed all the, the panelists' discussions. The question, Rachel, like, a big topic that kind of came through as a thread between all the panelists is around is around access to land across the UK. How how do we accelerate the the ability to identify new land locations to lay down the the EV infrastructure? And, and what are your views around how we could potentially accelerate the the DNO permitting and approval? approval process. I'd welcome your thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm sure um, this is something that you will have, have sort of butted up against, Richard, in, in your role. And we do know, we do know it's a real issue. Um, and we are, we are looking at tackling some of those barriers. Some of that does sit with the DNOs and with Ofgem, etc. Um, but as part of the project that we've got and the commitment that we've made to have six rapid high powered charge, sorry, six rapid Charges at every way, every motorway service station in just two years' time. We are proactively tackling that um, by upgrading that grid capacity and actually getting into the details of some of those issues uh, with not just the motorway service stations but also the strategic road network as well, uh, where those particular charging points need to be. But it, some of these issues are quite complex, but we we absolutely do have a plan to bring together all the relevant levers at our disposal to make sure that we tackle them. And we'll be saying a lot more about that actually in the document that we're going to publish later this year, which we're calling the infrastructure strategy, which really does address all these questions in a, in a lot of detail. So hopefully that will be very useful to yourselves and others. Great. Thanks, Rachel. Certainly will be. Rachel, I believe we have to let you go now, um, but thank you once again for your time. Just before you go, um, I wonder if you've had an opportunity yet to um, have a chat with Alok Sharma, president of COP26, of course, to, to give him some advice on what EV to buy, given that he's a diesel <laughs> driver. Have you had any joy with that? Oh, I talk to Alok regularly, and uh, of course he has got a lot on his plate, but I'm, I'm confident that he'll be making the switch very soon, and yeah. I'll personally uh, absolutely have a chat with him and continue to do that. March him to that forecourt. All right, thank you very much for your time. Thank and you. That's Rachel McLean. Thanks so everyone, to... bye. Goodbye, we're going to let Rachel McLean go, uh, Minister for uh, Transport Decarbonisation and Future of Transport. Um, but we still have Oliver and Sarah and Richard uh, with us. And do you know what? I think we might go back straight back to that question that Oliver brought up, which I will let you then pose to Sarah about consistency in, in car manufacturing and, and where you find the plug, basically. Oliver, over to you. <laughs> um, sure. Yeah, no, it's just it, it's just been, again, working with some of the early OEMs. It's just been an interesting uh, journey in terms of where the sockets on the vehicles um, ended up being in various different manufacturers and I think I know the answer to it in the long distant uh, history but I can't reveal it but I'm just curious to uh, maybe ask Sarah are the car OEMs talking to each other about where the sockets on the vehicles are or not? <laughs> um, yeah I, I can't I, I don't know is, is the straight answer <laughs> I don't know if we are at a, at a global factory level I mean for folks like an um, all of our charging points are in exactly the same place as the traditional fuel, um, you know, the fuel pumps would be. So it's consistent. It's consistent from a consumer's point of view and from your planning point of view. Uh, it, it doesn't change. Uh, I think some of the other brands in the sister group are the same as well. So I, I can't speak for the other manufacturers, but I could understand why it's, it's a complex problem for yourself. And presumably something that's Richard, something you've got to accommodate as well in terms of the, the charging infrastructure that you're developing. Richard, can you hear us there? Sorry, just repeat that. I lost you there. Was, I am yeah. so sorry. I presumably the different modes, uh, different uh, points, uh, socket points on the cars is something that you have to accommodate as well. Uh, absolutely. Within your charging so station. Not, not only working with people like uh, Oliver on the different charger technologies and the different cabling and the different connectors, but also how much space do you need for the vehicles to park safely and give space between each other right and so it's the the whole i mean at the moment as you know we're rolling out a lot of infrastructure either motorways or on some of the bp forecourts in, in the uk and and then when and as we go into different locations such as restaurants or pubs car parks and so on and so forth you know we need to give quite a lot of careful consideration to how the car park is going to evolve and and, and where the actual connection point actually will be yeah the basic practicalities of this Sarah, I know you have a point as well that you would like to make 
um, and possibly this is one for Oliver about, or oh, sorry, for Richard, I should say, about charging infrastructure, keeping up with consumer demand. Yeah, I was just wondering, you know, how confident Richard feeling about how the speed that the infrastructure is uh, moving on versus the speed that the car sales are moving on. You know, yeah. the, the, the sales are up sort of, fit, you know, 100% year on year from like this time last year, obviously the pandemic there, but, you know, the growth is massive. Um, um, and do we think the infrastructure is, is moving as fast? Well? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we, I, lost, I, we lost the last couple of words there, but I think I think you got the gist of it, Rich. Yeah, I did. Yeah, uh, so it's a terrific question. So I think a couple of ways to look at this. I think it depends on where where the charging is going to be. So I think in terms of home installations, right? I think that will be able to keep up more or less with with the demand of the car park growth. And then I think it's a lot easier to install slow charging infrastructure. Uh, the timeline to do that. So I think that will keep up depending on which customers want slow charging. The, the, the harder piece is going to be on uh, some of the fast chargers like the one I've got behind me. I think that's one of Oliver's units. Um, they take time, right? And I think, so we're confident that we have a very large footprint of real estate across the world, uh, in particular in Europe. Uh, so we're going to be laying down infrastructure, ultra fast charging infrastructure on, on pretty much all of BP's real estate. So that will give an, an instant impact on, on the network. Uh, so we feel confident about that. And in parallel, we're looking at identifying new locations uh, to complement that. And I think the key question will be is the, what's the constraint? And I, I raised it before, it's can we get the DNO approvals in time? And can we get the permitting done in time, right? Because we've got sites that have taken over a year uh, to go from start to finish of the process. And, and, and that is a long time. We've had charges sitting on the ground, ready to go, waiting for permits uh, for, for several months, right? And I think we've just got as a system, work out how we do that together. So it's a, re it's a really important uh, issue to resolve. Yeah, and, and that's one that's presumably down to planning authorities, um, as well as kind of wider government intervention. And, and on that, actually, this is a really interesting question, which really should be directed towards the minister. But unfortunately, she's not here. This is from Wayne. He says, in my particular area, there have been some large car parks and housing estates being built. Are there any plans to make it policy to install EV charging infrastructure by default? Are we moving, Richard, to that sort of position? Yes, yeah, so I, I think you, uh, what you're seeing in most new built properties, are, uh, certainly uh, apartment blocks are mandating now charging infrastructure to be installed at any base. Yeah, And, and I think in what we do when we look at our analytics of our network and then through the partnerships with Sarah's organization with BW, we kind of said we're going to lay out 4,000 uh, ultra fast chargers across Europe uh, in the coming couple of years. Um, you know, the, 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 we're building this uh, execution engine in, in BP to roll this out as fast, as safely, as compliantly as possible. And, you know, and it's working with the likes of Sarah and Oliver to, to, to make sure that the, the, the red tape is, is trimmed as much as possible for us to get this going down. Because the, the complexity of this is, is, is quite high because you're, not one company can, result, can provide the end-to-end -end perfect solution. Right. So a lot of these charges rely on Wi-Fi, they rely on, on tele, telco connections. You know, I'm reliant on Oliver's charger working as we expect it to. I'm reliant on the car and the software in the car to recognize the charger so it works well. And, and unfortunately, the customers who complain typically complain to us as BP because the charger is not working with it. And we'll, we need to take accountability for that. Don't get me wrong. But all I'm saying is when we look at all the root cause failures of a reliability challenge, Sadly, they're not all down to us, but the customer obviously doesn't care about that, and rightly so. Yeah, and Sarah, and this, what Richard has just said, I think, said there, rolls into another point you want to make that Oliver's already alluded to, but perhaps you want to put it to him directly about informing people and giving consumers confidence about charging infrastructure. Sarah, do you want to make that point? Yeah, I thought it was interesting earlier when you mentioned, you know, the different types of chargers and how you'd use them at different locations. And um, I lived with my uh, ID3 for the first month without home charging. So I was forced into using public charging and, you know, that, that was great. It was good. But actually what's interesting is I talked to peers who have got home charging and charging at the office and they're petrified of the public charging infrastructure. And we're in the industry and we're supposed to be leading by example. So you know, I just wondered, 
you know, what your thoughts were on how, you know, probably collectively, we need to help um, customers, consumers understand how to use public charging effectively, how easy it can be, you know, again, busting those myths really around that. Yeah, I, I think that, um, that, that in terms of my experience, again, go back to my habit, habitual sort of thing about how many times you need to do it, it becomes natural. Every time you go to a different charging, and again, I took my son as a real life example, I took my son to Bristol the other week for him to go and look at the university. And, and I, I meant to stop on, on route and something wasn't working on a particular um, service station. And so I, I arrived in Bristol with virtually nothing to then have to then go and spend two hours stationary. And I then looked up the local charging infrastructure on the usual apps, et cetera, found myself a charging space, then gave my son the phone and it took him sort of 10 minutes to get it going. So it taken me at least half an hour to get it going. Um, but we successfully then left the car charging while I was doing something else. And that's what you need to do. But I think almost like if you've got, if you take your car to the chargers, and almost make mini videos for your buyers to then say, okay, this is how you charge an ID3 on, on Richard's network. This is how you do charge it on somebody else's network. I think those little sort of short video clips is the way that everyone's but, learning things. But, but it's crazy that we're thinking about separate videos for separate networks. Exactly. It's got to be standardized. Exactly. And that's and that's where the, the sort of plug in and tap is the is the de facto, and that's the expectation. Um, but that isn't necessarily what everyone wants to operate like so that is a, a key barrier and and that's you know like richard's got a, a, men, mem, a membership progress uh, process and also a, a, a tap card process both to which i've joined but generally when i turn up i can't find whatever i need to get it going i just tap my card and that is the de facto um mm. that, that needs to be available on in my personal opinion it needs to be available on every charge point so anybody who's you know, dare I say, not even vaguely tech savvy, but I again see lots of older people, uh, which is an important demographic, which are perfect EV drivers. They don't do hardly any miles. You know, if, if, if my parents had one solar panel on the roof of their car, that would be enough electricity for them to never plug into the house or the public charge it ever again, because they probably do about 20 miles a week or a month. Yeah. So I think it's important to tune into the demographics that are, are easy wins, not in terms of decarbonisation, but in terms of just easy adopters, which will just help take that off the street. But it does just need to be simple. Yeah. I'm curious to know, by the way, how low do you go when you say you were nearly empty in Bristol? Mm, yeah, I was sub 50 and, and I had 180 miles to get home. So that's nothing. That's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> You don't go low until you've got to the three lines at zero. Yeah, and yeah. Still, I, you think, ah. I have got home with. I have got home I've got with six two, miles to get home. It's fine. Yeah, I've had two miles on the clock before, and I got on the drive, and that was uh, <laughs> pushing the envelope a bit. Um, Richard, I know you wanted to make a really important point about, and and again, we touched on it, but it, perhaps it's worth highlighting the importance of OEMs, charging manufacturers, energy companies working together, and I don't know how difficult that is to manage you have great industry perspective on this so do you want to say something on that and we can get response from both sarah and oliver yeah sure so i think uh, we work very closely with with both adb and vw right so as an example and i think what's very clear to us is that when the three companies for example come together to resolve certain issues the the outcomes are normally much better because you look at the whole end-to-end -end customer experience and when they buy the car go home, go on the go, you know, and, and we're able to, 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 to understand all of those pain points and try and work them together. I think the other thing is, you know, what we're, we're working with, with, uh, with companies like VW is around how do you, how do you show up in the customer, in the, in the in-car dashboard, uh, such that when you try and locate charges or maybe even book charges or even gain loyalty points for using a charger, how does that experience over time evolve? So it's a lot more proactive rather than reactive. So I think they're the kind of opportunities that will come, but at the moment, the main opportunities, I think, is how do we, how do we eliminate range anxiety? And the answer to that is you've got to have the network down at the speed that the customers want, um, you know, at, at, at a pretty high pace. And I, I was looking at some of the comments in the chat, I just wanted to address one of the last ones around, 
you know, around reliability again. And I think it's a, it's a good question. You know, saying that people like uh, Instable have, have a strong reliability in the UK. And I think it's a good example around when you have a standardized network uh, with a certain sort of charger, it's easier to get to a high reliability. And I think what we're seeing after the acquisition of Charge Master is now be, be pulse. We've got several different chargers across the network. And we're putting the investment in to create that standardization, which will lift the reliability and improve the customer experience. And I think you know the data that we can access from the charging provider, uh, the, the manufacturer such as Oliver's business or from the OEM to really focus on what the customer wants is, is the breakthrough that we, we probably need to get around. Yeah. And, and I think, look, one of the other key, key points in all of this, because again, for our audience, for a BBC audience, the one thing that comes up time and time again with electric cars is they're too expensive. I can't afford them. So we've had a question um, from one of our participants, VW, um, often regarded as the people's car. What steps are you taking to increase accessibility and affordability? Which is, I suppose, really one for you, Sarah. But I'm thinking about my niece, who's just qualified from university, started work as a junior doctor. So she's there doing an essential service for the NHS. She's got a budget of about £3,000 to buy her car. She can't get an EV for that. When would she be able to buy an EV on that kind of budget? And of course, we're talking second hand here. Or is it inevitable that we are going to be looking at affordable lease options in the future? I think it's a combination of everything. Obviously, as, as the... Um, the car park of the early EVs ages, they will become, they will come down in price naturally. Um, although at the moment we are experiencing uh, significantly higher prices in the used car market at the moment because of the shortfall of new cars because of the semiconductor chip situation. So, you know, used cars will will come in at the lower price points. Um, also, it's around uh, finance, you know, flexible financing solutions, um, or maybe looking at different types of ownership models as well subscription models is, is a different way to access you know owning a vehicle as well um but for volkswagen um yeah as we announced this week id life which is our new concept car that is a small car segment model that will come in at a lower price point as a new car as well so and and again of course as, as those cars age and have, have, have built up in time they'll come in at a lower price points as well i think and all manufacturers will be doing that you know as we we move all of our ranges from the the traditional ice range through to, to electric as well. Yeah. Do, do any of the other panellists have anything to say about that, about affordability, accessibility? Because the other thing is, as somebody made the point earlier, there just isn't a huge market in, in secondhand market, I should say, in electric vehicles yet. I, I think that we often underestimate the scale and the complexity of this energy transition. It is one of the biggest and most complex things that's happened in society for years you're changing the technology of the vehicle you're changing the way the vehicle is energized you're changing the infrastructure uh you're changing the consumer behavior it's it, it, it's it's huge right and, and i think the challenge is going to be how uh how do you do that cost competitively versus the traditional infrastructure such as the the ice vehicle supplied with petrol or, or diesel right so Government has a key role to play in providing the necessary incentives, but I'm confident that the companies like ours with the ones on the call and the people listening will all drive costs down through scale, through mass adoption, through partnerships. And then you'll start to see the, the total cost of ownership falling well below um, you know, the, the, the existing alternative today, right? I mean, just look at battery costs, how they've trended down over the last few years it's incredible progress but we, we unfortunately you can't leapfrog 10 years we want to be in 2030 in 2021 but unfortunately we're in 2021 with the cost structure and the technology and the demand profile that we have today well when we look to the future it's all very exciting i know that the participants anyone viewing this today we tend to talk with these subjects to a very very well informed audience so i'm grateful to everyone who's uh, been there been listening and watching and sending in their questions i guess then it's really about getting out that message to to a much much wider um, consumer audience but as as you know with anyone who embarks on a journey towards uh, electric vehicles or embraces it in some way you, you then become quite, quite evangelical about it and i think we've heard that from from everyone involved this morning including the government minister it has to be said um before we wrap though 
I'm excited to be able to say, and Oliver will be excited about this as well, that we have news on the winner of the emoji. So let me tell you, I think Oliver, you have found out who it is, but if I can announce uh, that the winner of the emoji, there it is, is Lucia, who is an 11 year old girl from Spain. There's the winning design. She said, I'd love to have an electric vehicle. I'd love it to be my first car because I know they care for the environment. I'm very excited to have participated in this context contest to help create the first EV emoji. I love it. But now the battle is on uh, to try and get it accepted by the board of emoji people, <laughs> whoever they are. So look, hopefully that will be available on your phones, on your smart screens at some point soon for, for everyone to use. And, and we will see it very widely used all the way around the world. Uh, now, before I say goodbye, finally, to our panellists, I just want to say thank you very, very much to each and every one of them. It's been it's genuinely enlightening and always inspiring and energising to hear the commitment from people right across the industry to bring about this change and in challenging circumstances to, to try and make it as, as rapid as we possibly can and, and help drive towards the mass adoption of, of EVs. Um, this is only the start, I should say, of World EV Day 2021. So do keep an eye on social media across the rest of the day today. Make sure you like and share to spread the word far and wide. And we have two more fantastic panels coming up later on today. There's still time to register for those. So at two o'clock UK time, we have a panel on how social media can be used to accelerate EV adoption with speakers from Green.TV, TikTok, LinkedIn and Autotrader. And then at 6 p.m. UK time, our final panel of the day is on school bus electrification and V2G, vehicle to grid, featuring speakers from Highland Electric, Nuv, is it Nuv, Proterra, Lion Electric and Moms Clean Air Force. So many, many thanks to Oliver Johnson from ABB, Sarah Cox from VW, uh, Richard Bartlett from BP, of course, and Rachel McLean, uh, the government minister uh, responsible for decarbonisation of our transport network. I really appreciate all your time today. Thank you to all of you who watched and listened and sent in questions and a very happy World EV Day. We hope to see you all at the next EV Summit online series event very, very soon.